that unfolds our day, get ready for the welcome reception. We come to one of the most popular sessions at the symposium, the Lightning Talks. Today you're going to hear about topics related to the future of food from a few different perspectives. Your speakers range from graduate students to CEOs and everything in between. The one thing they have in common is they are passionate about their topics, and these presentations are often among the best you will see over these two days. To present our last session of the day, it's a pleasure to introduce AGS Council Member and Deputy Director of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, Dr. Wes Rizzer. Wes? Thank you, John. Uh, indeed, I think this is the most fun part of every day at Geography 2050. And it's also the hardest. It's one thing to talk for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. It's another to take everything you're doing and condense it down into five minutes. As they talk, their slides advance automatically without their control. And at the end of the five minutes, we're going to cut the mic so that the next person can come. Because I know we're all looking forward to the conversation that comes afterwards. Uh, this is such a pleasure to be here with HES. It is especially a pleasure to welcome my temporary boss, uh, Admiral Whitworth, onto the stage. As I'm on loan right now to NGA. Uh, and now I, we are the last thing between you and the reception. So without further ado, as we get running down, let me welcome to the stage first Miss Amanda Bird and Miss Hannah Rush for our first lightning talk. Thank you. Oh, this is not the first slide, but that is okay. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Amanda Bird, and this is Hannah Rush. We're the geographers at Dewberry, which is a nationwide professional services firm. And today we're going to talk about our project, which is um, developing a regional food assistance information sharing framework in our lessons learned from the metropolitan Washington region. So this project was done for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and the D.C. Emergency Management Agency. And Dewberry was a subcontractor to the Center for Naval Analysis, or CNA. Um, it'd be awesome if there was a map that was showing that area. There's 24 jurisdictions, though. Imagine D.C., uh, in the surrounding counties, and then there's five and a half million people in this area, so there's a lot of people that this is uh, affecting. Um, so this was funded by a FEMA Regional Catastrophic Preparedness Grant, which is a program that supports projects aimed at closing supply chain logistics capability gaps to build a more resilient region. And for this project, we're talking about the food supply chain, and it's important to note, you know, this is developed in relation to, to a catastrophic incident. Um, so what we did for this project was we reviewed existing information sharing frameworks, but not necessarily around food, and then we were tasked with building a regional food supply chain platform. And this was to provide emergency managers in particular with situational awareness of the food supply chain, and particularly food assistance before, during, and after disaster incidents. Uh, so throughout the stakeholder engagement process, there were a few main themes that stood out to us. First, a determination of the audience for our information sharing platform that we were creating. Next, the main use cases for the information sharing platform. And finally, the need to establish data consistency. So from our conversations, we saw that the main audience would, for our platform would be food assistance customers, emergency managers, and food assistance providers. And each of these audience types would see different views of the tool for, for the various audience types. So stakeholders also decided upon the three main use cases for the information sharing framework. First, an ability to understand baseline food assistance need throughout the region. Next, to track changes in food assistance need following disaster situations. And finally, to aid in the distribution of grant funding to organizations across the region. Our final theme centered around establishing regional data consistency. Stakeholders expressed a need to standardize data schema as well as data collection, and one way of doing this would be to increase the number of data sharing agreements to connect local, federal, and jurisdictional data to be put into the platform. So reflecting on our work throughout this project, um, there are a few lessons that stand out to us. First, the importance of collaboration. Next, keeping the momentum and continuing this conversation to support relationship building in the region going forward. And finally, the benefits of engaging stakeholders early on in the development process. So at our workshop, which Amanda previously mentioned, um, we saw that the stakeholders in the room were 
all doing very similar work, but they had never collaborated before. So by bringing together people from organizations across the region, we were able to incorporate their unique perspectives and goals for an information sharing framework and platform in order to contribute to a unified regional food assistance effort. So our interviews and workshop were only the first step in establishing this framework. Going forward, in order to keep momentum and continue the conversation, we recommend um, facilitating interaction between stakeholders through workshops, meetings, and data sharing agreements in order to build relationships that will support the region in disaster situations. And finally, we saw that by beginning our work engaging stakeholders, we were able to connect to those directly involved in food assistance in the region and then identify pre-existing capabilities and gaps in information sharing in order to create their ideal information sharing framework, which we would have also seen in the in our first few slides. So if you have any questions for us, we are happy to expand upon this. Um, thank you so much for listening, and uh, yep, have a good one. Thank you, Amanda and Hannah. Next up, we welcome Dr. Mariah M. Key from the USDA. are key to narrowing health disparities in obesity and other chronic diseases. Your body mass index is your weight divided by your height squared. People with a BMI greater than 30 are considered to be obese. Imagine you have a family member dealing with a chronic obesity-related disease or has poor physical mobility. What would be their options or best advice for achieving a healthy weight? Should they go? Where should they go to find food? Location A or B? What kind of medical clinic can they go to when they need support? A or B? Where can they exercise? Will they go to A or B? And what do they need to eat to be healthier? Will they eat A? Most of these options, you'll see that it is option B, B that is the healthiest option. But many people don't have uh, access to all options B or any options B in some cases. The problem of obesity has increased around the world. North America leads the world in our obesity um, pet prevalence. It is one of the most obese areas around the world. Over women in particular have a 150% greater likelihood of being obese than men. In the United States, we see great regional differences in obesity. In 2011, this is what our obesity map looked like. Today, it is much warmer. We have greater levels of obesity around the nation. The only so-called region with less than 25% Obesity prevalence is Washington, D.C. The states of West Virginia and Kentucky have nearly 50% obesity region. You are much more likely to be obese if you live in the South, are low to middle income, have intermittent food access, uh, assistance, and are food insecure, have less than college education, and are non Hispanic, Black, or Native American. Wherever it resides, excess weight is reshaping our da daily calorie, transportation, and health care needs for large classes and for our society. How will we narrow the health obesity-related disparities? We need a food system, social conditions, and relationships that support healthier lifestyles. Obesity is a challenge carried by society, and food networks need to act in conjunction with social determinants of health to support health. Social determinants of health include people's health care access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, economic stability, and education access and quality. Concerns raised by USDA research um, Excuse me. <laughs> um, include the need for um, um, the, the need for greater understanding of the social context and obesity. We do see some areas.
rates of improvement. We see that in schools there's a decrease in there's an increase, excuse me, in the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables being delivered to schools over the last ten years. And the White House has a pledge to increase this even further. In terms of food access, there's in, there is more concern. There's an increase overall in the U.S. Census tracts of those without healthy available food in their um, census tract, and we also see an increase and a surge in disparities following COVID-19. In work I have done with my colleague Brandon Rostepo, we show that the early pandemic trends indicate that there is an increase in obesity, especially among young people in the 20 to 39 age category. And there's also an increase in disparities that were already there. They're just magnified among racial and ethnic groups, with black Americans having the greatest increases in obesity. So in conclusion, I just want to leave you with the idea that in that it's not just individuals, but it's society living with obesity. And it's not evenly distributed across the population. Social determinants play a role in determining what is going, the level of obesity prevalence and future research by economists and geographers on the social side can help to narrow these gaps of obesity. Thank you so much, Dr. M. Next up, we welcome Mr. Amin al from the University of Maryland. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. My name is Amin al and I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland Department of Geographical Sciences. Uh, my talk today is titled Systems, Responses, and Impacts Exploring Water Security, Food Security, and Climate Change in Madagascar. I don't see my slides, so I'm going to wait. There it is. Okay. Um, I'm going to wait for it to auto. Awesome. So we live in a time when human activity has tremendous impact on the environment. One such manifestation of this is increased frequency and magnitude of extreme weather events and climate disasters. Examining and addressing these phenomena and their impact on food and water systems is of great importance. So here we choose to explore these questions in the context of Madagascar. As background, Madagascar has experienced more than three years of consecutive drought, leaving 1.5 million people facing extreme hunger, and it experiences on average four cyclones annually ravaging the country and leaving behind tremendous amounts of damage. So our objective is to understand local perceptions of governance in response to climate disaster. Our objectives can be dissected into three parts. One, to identify the role of governance. Two, to compare and contrast local and national governance. And three, to evaluate the effectiveness of each in disaster response efforts. Methodologically, we analyze data from five focus group discussions. Data collection took place in five unique locations across the island country of Madagascar. Qualitative analysis methods were used with an emphasis on analytical memoing throughout the process. So in the next slide, we'll see on the map on the left-hand side, figure one, the five site locations where we conducted our five focus groups, and the map on the right from NASA Earth Observatory here showing in brown the areas that are uh, drought-stressed in terms of their vegetation, and this is as of September 2022. So here we see the NDVI anomalies. So the results will be summarized in a figure. So natural resource governance in Madagascar can be divided into two. Bottom-up governance via the Fokinolona, which is a traditional form of local Malagasy governance, and top-down governance via the Malagasy national government. We see this here illustrated in the figure. Regarding our objective part one, we identify the roles of each body. For the Fokinolona, that means three things. Adaptation, survival, and local resource protection. For the Malagasy national government, that is monetary solicitation through trade deals and aid and special election season policies that are enforced during an election season. Regarding our objective, part two, we compare the two bodies and their spatio-temporal characteristics. The Vulcanolona operates on the spatial scale of the village and temporally their responses are short term. In contrast, the Malagasy national government operates at the spatial scale of the entire country and their involvement and responses are more long term. Additionally, each of these bodies' authorities is unique, and their sources of authority is unique. 
The folk in Alona derives its authority from fadi, social taboos, dinabe, which are social contracts, and local buy-in, mainly soft power. And the government derives its authority from statehood and through its police, so a bit of a, a stronger power here. Regarding our third objective, or part three of our objective, to evaluate the effectiveness, ultimately, despite having two governance systems that can work in tandem with each other to ensure food and water security, we find instead that these bodies are unable to ensure food and water security due to their inability to collaborate effectively. This ineffective collaboration manifests itself in many ways. For the folk in Alona, the traditional form of government, this means disenfranchisement of the people, poverty and unmet needs, reliance on aid for survival, and lack of education. For the government, what does this mean? Here we see. For the national government, this means no accountability. This no accountability ultimately opens avenues for mismanagement, corruption, poor infrastructure, poor governance, overall providing a system that permits bad actors to behave improperly. And then lastly, uh, but not least, for the environment, we see that this means three things. Unsustainable natural resource use, environmental harm, and natural exploitation. These human activities are seen both as a means of survival for some and as a means of profit and personal gain for others. These are often in the forms of deforestation and causes a tremendous biodiversity loss. Ultimately, it is these environmental manifestations that further drive these climate and climate change related disasters. This creates a feedback loop that further perpetuates these perceived dynamics and further reduces the possibilities of establishing food and water security and resilience. Um, so from this, we see that our preliminary findings are two. One, collaborative natural resource governance structures can be established, and they can ensure proper management, policy, and accountability. Two, stakeholder engagement and local involvement is key to ensure climate change resilience. This is especially important to ensure the future of water and food security. Next steps for research include exploring the role of NGOs and civil societies in natural resource governance in Madagascar, and secondly, we'd like to quantify the climate change resilience within Madagascar, especially in areas most prone to disaster, which in this case here we see, which is the, the, the south part of the region. I'd like to thank the American Geographical Council and the Society for their opportunity to present today and for their funding, as well as the NSF and our team on food, energy, water nexus studies. I'd like to also thank my advisor, Dr. Meredith Gore, and our wonderful collaborators on the island. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to talk, connect. So here's my LinkedIn and email if anyone would like to do so. And I look forward to speaking with some of you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ami. Next to the stage, let's welcome Dr. Michael Ferrari from Climate Alpha. OK, I'm going to steal a couple seconds. But, um, no, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to just jump right in. So, Climate Alpha focuses on the adaptation side of the climate discussion. So there's obviously mitigation adaptation. We're really focused on what to do about things that are already going to happen. So I approach the agriculture water nexus from the perspective of a scientist and engineer, but I really focus on deploying capital. How do we make investment decisions? How do we anticipate risk and opportunities? The first thing we need to understand, this scenario is big deal. Um, we spent a lot of time and resources. A lot of jet fuel has been burned over the last week or two to get people in Egypt to really understand and kind of focus on a goal that really is unattainable. If we're doing the right thing from a water and agriculture perspective, we have to really think that two and a half, to, you know, roughly two and a half degrees is already baked in, and that's the future that we have to anticipate. The other thing that I'd like to walk away with in a few minutes is there is a water fingerprint just about everywhere. Everything you touch, everything you feel, everything we buy, everything we spend, there is a water connection there with the attribution science. We need to start to understand these relationships a little bit more. Right now, when it comes to agriculture, I mean, everybody kind of knows these statistics. This is probably, you know, in terms of how many gigatons are in the atmosphere, you know, it's probably underestimated, but let's just assume the numbers are the numbers. Agriculture makes a significant portion of this, but very, very little capital is deployed on the agriculture side. Of that, very little is deployed to the allocation side. Uh, Dr. Rosenzweig showed a uh, slide of similar to this. We all kind of know this. These are the trends from race uh, missions recently. The wet areas are getting wetter, dry areas are getting drier. This is most likely going to continue. This is not all rough. You know, not just risk. There is opportunity embedded here. And as modelers, one thing that we need to understand, we need to stop focusing on the absolutes, understanding variability, understanding dynamics. It's a lot more important than trying to get the, down to you know, the deterministic forecast. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes and kind of explore some of the connections. Now, as you think about the, you know, what does this mean from an economy standpoint? I look at any index, any trade 
privileged, right? There isn't one or fingerprint anywhere. There are some of Moravia's who kind of know what's the relationship with things like corn, soy, wheat. There's also relationships between things like lithium and gold and palladium. And by trying to tease out what that water agriculture relationship is to the investment vehicles is very important. Let's look at the dry bulb again. So this is basically an indicator of how much physical commodities are being transported. This is just the last five years. Every price spike on this chart has been tied in some way to a lack of water in navigable channels. So you can't get material through, prices go up, you have a price spike. What does gold have to do with agriculture? If you're a grower in India, you're a sugarcane grower, you have a healthy monsoon, if you're a water balance, you buy more gold with your extra um, certain income, drives the price of gold up, but that also has an impact on the U.S. dollar. So indirectly, the global benchmark currency has a relationship with the Indian monsoon and sugar. What about clothes? I mean, there's always this discussion between food and fuel, but there's also food and fiber. There's more demand for fiber. Cotton is a really, really thirsty crop. When you plant more cotton, you're taking away from things like staples, like um, pulses, oil seeds, um, and a variety of uh, staple crops that really support diets. Now, you know, that's just the agriculture side. Let's move to the input side. If we kind of look at just the U.S. right now, this is kind of the drought snapshot. What are we looking at as far as water sustainability? And we kind of looked at the, what we see in the next slide is a lot of these areas that are dry also align with, you know, where are the nitrates, where's the phosphate, you know, the MPK uh, scenario, where are all these materials that are inputs that also affect growers' bottom lines. There's a direct water benefit and water relationship there that if it's not anticipated and not understood, you're always reactive. You know, so we can't anticipate these things, you're always reactive, and you're usually behind the uh, you know, really kind of not able to take advantage of the instruments that are available to you. Um, so as modelers, well, again, what we're going to move away from is a deterministic forecast and look at the spectrum of possibilities. Every decision should be a probability distribution function. Your answer could be anywhere in there. And as a data scientist, you know, we want to move from the top left to the bottom right. There's this, you know, this idea that all we want is more and more data, which is great. But really, you know, smart data, making sure the right data is aligned to the right question, the right use case, these are the things that should be driving where data is going forward. And right now, it's currently not being used that way. Um, I always like to finish with this slide because when we start to think about what are we assuming as modelers, we don't get the answer we allow to So a lot of times we build a model, if you're overfitting and you're correcting, you might have the right answer for the wrong reasons. We really need to really think about how we're deploying data, how we're deploying capital. And if that means rethinking our assumptions, we need to do so. Uh, finally, I just want to finish with um, Howard Shapiro, some of you might know, who's my first mentor at Mars. He, for decades, he's been talking about this idea of nutrition security. There's a lot, just because we can grill calories does not mean they're the right calories. There's a lot of empty calories out there that a lot of people are consuming with absolutely no nutritional benefit. We need to move away from that and move towards something where, again, water is the fulcrum of driving not just food security, but nutrition security is important. I can talk about this without taking a breath for hours. I don't have the luxury to do that now, but if anybody really wants to talk to me, I'll be around tonight. Please look me up. I'd be happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Next up to the stage, we welcome Mr. Skip Vaselli of Pixel Space Technologies. I'm Skip. That's hyperspectral. Let's fly. Um, uh, so hyperspectral data, or HSI, provides a lot more data than the human eye or camera can see. It collects hundreds of narrow bands between the blue and the infrared parts of the light spectrum, far more than a, a common system would see. Uh, think of hyperspectral as a prism that uh, breaks light up into beams or bands, as we call them. And the narrower the band, the more subtle and elusive uh, the data captured by the sensor. Uh, therefore, crop monitoring would enjoy the finer details of biochemical and biophysical conditions uh, resulting, uh, especially in our, veg our vegetation and soils. Now, studies indicate that a population of 9.7 billion in 2050 will need to be fed by a 70% higher crop yield, yet we're seeing up to 40% staple crops lost each year due to stress and pathogens. Uh, hyperspectral uh, data analysis is used to develop and apply prediction and remediation practices uh, in the growth cycle, early in the growth cycle, to identify and counter invisible but impactful causes by detecting stresses at the earliest and the most invisible stages. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, imagery examples from key global uh, international government uh, hyperspectral systems, including our own uh, unmanned aerial vehicle hyperspectral systems. Uh, manned aerial systems such as NASA's Avaris hyperspectral system and data from a recently launched first uh, commercial hypersatellite system. Now, from an agricultural monitoring perspective, there are large amounts of highly useful space-based imagery with both fine spectral and fine spatial resolution. Over the next two years, there will be a dramatic increase in the number of commercial hyperspectral satellites, each with hundreds
Avengers of Bands and the Missile Bone Shortwave IR regions. The first systems up will have at least 250 bands, ranging from 10 to 30 meter or 5 meter uh, pixel sizes. Uh, and for comparison, the best um, publicly available hyperspectral systems today produce only 30 meter ground sampling distances. Now, this uh, hyperspectral systems provide a crop parameters that are too subtle for traditional systems to see. And these parameters include water and, and, and uh, disease related stresses, evapotranspiration rates, chemical treatment uh, effectivities, nutrient levels. And it's important to correlate these satellite based data sets to in situ measurements. And with the advent of cloud computing and machine learning uh, applied to these complex data sets, we can and should expect improvement in agricultural production and management. Now, this is a hyperspectral image. Uh, from pixel rendered as false color IR, meaning the magenta colors that you see correspond to active crops. From 150 bands, we can select those needed to say characterize 11 uh, vegetation types, or better yet, variations with each of the, within each of those vegetation types due to some sort of stress or other uh, effect. And we're still developing these algorithms today for HSI. Uh, and there's a, a color, just a regular color image, just for uh, relationships there. Um, the emphasis on spectral content between very narrow bands, for example, in the in two IR bands separated only by two nanometers, we can subtract one from the other, uh, and rather than seeing orthogonal patterns like you would expect, we're seeing uh, instead amorphous shapes, possibly due to terrain drainage patterns, soil types, subsurface conditions, spraying patterns from herbicides, or maybe migrating nutrients and pollutants uh, that don't necessarily follow crop boundaries. This is an image cube that shows a stack of images where each layer in the stack is an image representing one of 250 spectral bands. If you look at pixel X and drill down, it, it registers a different value uh, for each band until it forms a unique signature or curve. Since the ground is not homogeneous, we can mathematically unmix that pixel using its uh, image processing into its uh, individual graphs, which comprise that composite signature you see above. These spectral signatures uh, that comprise that can then be mapped through a spectral library to the presence of herbicides, heavy metals, certain nutrients, etc. Uh, the information bottom line inside of a hyperspectral pixel is all about a spectral signature and resolution, and multiple signatures can be pulled out from a single pixel. So satellite hyperspectral systems, according to studies, are far less prevalent than ground-based and airborne systems, uh, yet satellites offer robust temporal monitoring allow access to large areas faster, cheaper, and globally. Uh, we have exquisite satellite sensors and data uh, science, tremendous compute power, incredible amounts of data, but what we lack is testing rigor and use cases that link uh, what agronomists need uh, with those who understand, build, and operate hyperspectral uh, sensors, algorithms, and spectral libraries. Uh, we should use venues such as this one uh, to invigorate an active consortium that combines uh, HSI science with agronomy to address global food production, food uh, security, food quality, uh, and especially with all this being exacerbate, exacerbated by um, global challenges such as climate change, water availability, soil erosion, chemical overuse, etc. Uh, I'm happy to unconfuse anybody that needs to be unconfused uh, today into social. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Skip. Definitely a call to action to bring our remote sensors together with our agronomists, climatologists, etc. There's so much cross pollinization we can do in this room. Next up, Dr. Katarina Pasadomo of the University of Mississippi. Thank you. If you know anything about Oxford, Mississippi, where I live and work, it may be that it is the hometown of William Faulkner, one of this country's most celebrated novelists. Among many other things, Faulkner famously wrote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. We see evidence of this truth all around us, our institutions, systems of labor and exchange, and even ways of relating to one another reflect processes and, pa and practices set in motion generations ago. The past reverberates in powerful ways in our food system, where labor regimes reflect the logics of the plantation. Ethnic and racial minorities continue to provide essential labor, and people who work all along the food chain are generally underpaid, overworked, and lacking important protections. We are aware of other problems associated with our contemporary food system. While industrial 
industrialization and globalization have created some efficiencies. They have also bred externalities. Despite producing more than enough food for every person on the planet to have sufficient daily calories, over a billion people are hungry, malnourished, or both. Climate change is threatening agricultural productivity through increasing droughts, rising temperatures, and ecosystem imbalances. At the same time, our dominant food production, distribution, consumption, and disposal practices also contribute to environmental degradation through deforestation, over-harvesting of wild resources, cultivation of marginal lands, increased consumption of industrial meat and dairy, and organic off-gassing in landfills. These and other problems have led many to claim that our food system is broken. But I want to argue that these externalities are evidence of a system working exactly as and for whom it was intended to work. In other words, our food system was designed this way, not principally to feed people, but to generate profit. The writer and cultural commentator Ijwoma Aluo has a phrase for systems that we often mistakenly describe as broken. The criminal justice system, the immigration system, the food system, for example. This phrase is works according to design, and it calls us to refuse to let our shock and outrage distract us into thinking that these perceived failures do not all stem from the same root source, which must be dismantled. In the case of the food system, the root source is the quest for profit. Dismantling one system in favor of another may sound radical, but if we are to imagine food systems that work for everyone, whose primary functions are to nourish people in culturally and environmentally sustaining ways, we need to re return to the roots of all food systems. People, animals, plants, land, water, and the connections among them. Paradoxically, then, a radical and sustainable food future may mean reflecting on our shared past. Before food was imagined and designed as a corporate commodity, a tool for generating profit, and a system built upon racialized labor. There are a lot of hopeful examples of communities around the world who are reclaiming food systems, land, and power simultaneously. They are doing so against enormous odds. The Quechua and Aymara-speaking indigenous communities of the Peruvian highlands, for example, continue to cultivate hundreds of varieties of potatoes on the same mountain slopes where the tuber was first domesticated thousands of years ago. They noted changes in the climate decades ago and began planting at higher altitudes. They maintain a seed bank and share potato varieties with other local indigenous communities, exchanging knowledge as well as seed. If we are to have a clear-eyed understanding of the present, if we are bold and brave enough to imagine a more hopeful future, we have to confront and understand the past. While there is much to despair about our contemporary industrialized global food system and the conditions that created it, there are glimmers of hope. Like the roots of radical change, hope is nurtured at the grassroots, at small and local scales, and with critical engagement with the past. Critical thinking without hope is cynicism. Hope without critical thinking is naivete. Let us embrace a critical hope for a better food future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casanova, for that call to arms. Next up, let's welcome Dr. Kathleen.
as part of the Appalachian region, and Watauga County is one of these counties. We are a county in the northwest part of the state of North Carolina, and we are defined as at risk. The Feeding America website uh, provides some excellent data on um, at risk of uh, food insecurity, and Watauga County is again a county at high risk for food insecurity. The surrounding counties are also at risk for food insecurity. Um, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Watauga County is a county that is considered a, most of it, most of it is considered a food desert by the USDA. And this is the Hunger and Health Coalition in Boone, North Carolina, and they do an incredible amount of work with regards to food insecurity. Of course, geograph geographers have been interested in Appalachia for a very long time, and I wanted to uh, give sh just two shout outs, one to Helen Jamichel Semple, who characterized uh, the lifestyles of, of the Anglo Saxons, and our friend Ann Oberhauser, whose work on income generating activities of women are really insightful for looking at uh, the COVID 19 pandemic. So, we had to define what Appalachian culture is and if it can help explain resilience. This is a slide from our hometown of Boone, North Carolina, and we used it as an example of a way to look at resilience. One of the arguments put forward is that Appalachia suffers from a fragmented, short-lived system of community organization that emerged around a single issue. So we wanted to know if we could respond to a food crisis, even though we have these fragmented systems. We used uh, resilience traits as defined in the literature. There are six of them, and we found evidence for five of the six. First is our knowledge and skills available. Do strong community networks exist? Our robust people places exist? Here is our study site, uh, Watauga County. You can see that we talked to nonprofits, we talked to churches, we talked to the school system, and we did a lot of our work here at the State University. first quote I want to point out from one of our informants is a woman who manages the uh, Second Harvest Food Bank. She really wanted to emphasize that this crisis was different. She is in the food insecurity business, and they were not anticipating the grocery stores would run out of food. Second informant um, was Joan at the, uh, the Office of Sustainability. She said, what we do is relationships, so building strong community relationships. I love this quote here from Sally at the bottom. We've got 100 gallons of milk. Who can use it? County Commissioner Fred talked about what we do is we take care of ourselves in this community. This is a very strong community within Appalachia, the idea that we take care of each other here. We looked at the community infrastructure. Primarily, we looked at the Watauga County school system. We had the honor of talking to Deb, who's been a social worker there for 30 years. And she knew that we had to run the, back, run the buses backwards to provide food to kids. As we tried to measure the innovativeness and diversity of the economy, which is an important part of having a resilient system, we weren't able to come up with a good methodology for doing that. We are dominated by our university and the Blue Ridge Parkway. We did, however, find excellent evidence of, uh, of engaged governance. Fred County Commissioner talked about how they just pumped out, uh, pumped out information through the High Country radio system and through Zoom meetings. In conclusion, preparations before disaster is a really important part of a region's resilience. Watauga County had a big established network of organizations and people with decades of experience working together. Um, Peg, who was a county extension agent, talks about shifting the food sources back to more locally produced foods. She mentioned the work of Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture, who have been doing local development work for ages. I want to thank our uh, collaborators, the people who provide us information, Appalachian State University, Department of Geography and Planning, and Geographical Review. Thank you guys for publishing this article. Thank you so much, Dr. Schroeder.
it's great to have a presentation today that comes from our own flagship journal that so many of us have either published in or voraciously read, so thank you. We're going to close down our lightning talks today with Dr. Lou Ziska from right here at Columbia University's Climate School. Well, thank you very much. Being this guy usually used to being last, so. <laughs> but being last sometimes gives you the opportunity to be brief and to be blunt. We are facing a global crisis with respect to food security. We know that the ability to feed has been diminishing throughout most of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st. Since 2018, however, even prior to the pandemic, it has risen quite dramatically. At the moment, we have close to 350 million individuals who are food insecure. And the number of individuals who are going to go into famine, the number varies, the number who are going to die because of famine varies. A low of 5 million, a high of 50 million. Some of the most affected areas are in eastern part of Africa, particularly in areas that were discussed earlier, such as Somalia. That's not acceptable. Just to give you some sense of proportionality, 7 million died during the pandemic. Every aspect of food security is affected by climate change. Production sides affected by water, by temperature, by energy. Fossil fuels are essential fertilizers, by extremes, biotic measures, increasing changes in the demography of weeds, of insects, and disease, quality, nutrition, food safety will also be affected. A 30% increase in carbon dioxide is already affecting the quality, the nutritional quality of the foods that you are consuming. And then, of course, you have distribution, extreme events, where drought can not only affect how you grow, but it affects how you get that food to ports. Not that the Mississippi would ever dry out or anything, right? I mean, okay, wait, no. Um, it has the potential to impact all resource aspects of the Green Revolution, which was what brought us here, which what gave us the 8 billion people that we currently surpassed. So, when you start looking at this in terms of current research priorities, given this challenge, given this uh, immediate problem that involves so many individuals, what are we doing? What are we doing at the federal level? We need to publicly research dollars to sustain and improve agriculture. When you look at where the budgets currently are in terms of what is being spent by the U.S. taxpayers, you see something that looks like this. On the left, you'll see the Department of Defense. That's on the order of six, seven, eight hundred billion dollars. But you want to stay safe, right? We want to invest in a, in a strong military. Health and Human Services. We want the NIH, we want to have those dollars to study, to make sure that our health maintains, is maintained. Department of Energy, we want to be energy independent, NASA, and so forth. Finally, you get down, that's the Department of Agriculture. And there are two primary groups within the Department of Agriculture that do almost all of the work with respect to research. The National Institute of Food and Ag, which provides grants to land-grant universities, and the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. Let's put this in terms of tax dollars. Each one of you, every man, woman, and child in the United States, spends seven dollars every day to support the Department of Defense to make sure that we're safe. That's great. We can argue about that or whatever. We want to be safe. I would argue that food security is also important for us to be safe. And you've heard some of the reasons elucidated earlier today. But the, for the Department of Agriculture Research dollars, each of you are spending two cents per day in taxes. 
Could we double that? Literally, your two cents every day to make it four cents? Or God forbid, we could do a dime a day and quintuple our research in terms of what we spend and what we need to spend in order to address these challenges. I'm done for now, but we're not. We're not. We need to focus on this. We need to move forward to address this crisis. It isn't a question of how we're going to feed the next two billion. The greater question is how are we going to feed the eight billion that we currently have when we're not giving it the priority that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zisco. I think just in those last eight talks, we've encapsulated a lot of what today's conversation has brought, and there is a lot more to come tomorrow. I want to extend a special thanks to all of our presenters, and I also want to note that there are several people who proposed lightning talks but were unable to join us today. The program committee evaluated their proposals and selected another, a number of them to be recorded. If you go to the Geography 2050 website and click on the Lightning Talk button, you'll be able to access all of those additional Lightning Talks. And to you AP teachers out there, you can send them to your kids 